Hi, uh, this is Mrs. Cripp, and these are the notes for chapter 13, so you need to pull those out and fill in as we go. I'm going to be kind of going back and forth between not only this particular PDF, but also over here I've got the Prezi up that goes along with these notes. So this would be loaded in RenWeb already. You should be able to see a picture of a calorimeter at the beginning, which we're going to possibly do a little bit with later on. Um, there's the tutorials at the beginning as well, and you can see those later on, and you'll, you'll see there's um, different ones, a specific heat, heat of fusion and vaporization, and some practice problems. <coughs> okay, here's we are in the notes. Um, this is a thermal chemistry is what we're going to be covering. It's the branch of science that studies the transfer of energy during chemical reactions. That just means energy moving from one place to another during a chemical reaction, and that's thermal. Therm means heat. So thermochemistry is the heat of the chemistry. Um, temperature is the average kinetic energy. We've talked about that in the past in the particles of a sample. So remember, particles are moving very fast, and they're all moving. If you take the average movement energy, kinetic energy, that would be your temperature. Heat um, measures the total amount of thermal energy that's moving from one object to another. It's just the heat is the energy that goes from the hot object to the cold object, and it's expressed in joules. And that's just a unit for measuring heat, an uh, energy unit. Um, joules is the standard SI unit, and it can be measured for any kind of energy. And so we use kGa and kilojoules. And I'm going to just double check over here. So that's what all this is, right, where we've come so far. Um, we talked about, I'm going to get a pen. There we go. Uh, kilojoules, remember that kilo means 1,000. So kilojoules would be 1,000 joules. 1,000 joules is one kilojoule, and you're going to need to keep that in mind for unit conversions. We're going to still be doing unit conversions. And um, because it's impossible to determine the absolute amount of heat in something, chemists measure the change in energy. So the change in, remember that's a delta. Change in anything is a delta. So the change in energy that, occur, that happens during a chemical reaction. Enthalpy, H, is the heat. Heat, enthalpy, heat, Enthalpy, and it has an H, is the heat content of a system at a constant pressure. So we're going to be dealing with constant pressures and enthalpy. Um, your notes may look slightly different than mine. I, I fixed some things on yours, so, but, so yours should be a little bit better, by the way. A calorimeter, which I already had you watch a video about this, is an insulated container um, similar to a thermos. We're going to use two coffee cups in which a thermometer detects the temperature change that occurs, and we can use that to figure out the enthalpy inside that calorimeter. Okay, I'm going to go back right now to the Prezi for a moment, and let's see, I want you to watch this video right at the top. We've already watched this one down here, so I'm not going to require you to watch that one again. So we're going to watch this one, and I think this will pick up the, the um, sound. Thermochemistry is the study of the heat change in chemical reactions. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of particles. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So as the kinetic energy or the motion of particles increases, the temperature increases as well. So that is that the temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules in a substance. Heat, on the other hand, is the flow of energy from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. So temperature is a measure of energy and heat is the flow of energy from higher temperature to lower temperature, from hot to cold. So the, the thermometer measures temperature, but heat flows. Heat goes from the hotter to the colder. Thermal equilibrium is reached when two objects at different temperatures in contact with each other reach the same temperature. So here we have a picture of some substance, hot substance, it's red. Um, 7 degrees Celsius substance in an ice bath, a 5 degrees Celsius ice bath. Over time, the heat leaves the hot 70 degree uh, container and, go and enters the ice bath, warming it up. And at some point, the two temperatures are equal, and then they're said to be in thermal equilibrium. So how is this thermal equilibrium achieved? Here we have a microscopic view of this coffee mug filled with hot coffee. Here's the hot coffee on the left. Notice that these particles are moving faster than the particles of air on the outside. You can tell by they, they have longer tails. And the, the 
ceramic mug, the molecules are pretty orderly. What happens is that because of the large kinetic energy of the, of the molecules in the coffee, they hit these, the wall of the coffee mug pretty frequently. When they hit the wall of the coffee mug, they transfer some of their kinetic energy to the um, molecules in the ceramic mug, mug, so they're going to be vibrating more. And what happens is the molecules in the vibrating mug, the kinetic energy of those molecules, hit molecules outside in the air, transferring their kinetic energy to the molecules in the air. So the kinetic energy goes from the coffee through the mug to the air. The air around the coffee mug warms up because it gains some kinetic energy. The coffee and the mug cool down a little because they lose some kinetic energy. Okay. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about how the heat's flowing. The molecules are going to hit each other and transfer the energy from the hot to the cold until it all kind of evens out. All right, you don't need to know the bomb in this one, and I'm not going to watch that video because we've already seen it, but that brings us to sensible heat. And I have some really good illustrations in this video, but we're also going to need to draw some things in our notes. Um, first off, um, let me go back for a moment here. Sensible heat produces a temperature change. You can sense it. You can feel it. Okay? You can, so you, that's what it says. You can sense it and feel it. And then latent heat, and I call latent heat lazy. Right there, lazy. Because it's lying flat. Latent, lazy heat produces a phase change. It's flat on the graph. Latent, lazy, lying down, phase change, and it's flat. That means all the energy that's being... Um, given into the system is going to change it from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas. Okay? Um, so sensible heat is when you can feel it changing temperature. That's the temperature goes up or the temperature goes down. So what you're going to need to do in your notes, if you go back over here, here's whoops, where we are, we're going to draw an illustration. And there's one in the Prezi as well, but I'm going to draw it on here to show you what I want you to draw. Okay, here we go. We're going to have the x-axis and the y, or the y-axis and the x-axis right here. And we're going to start off, and just you're going to have to get used to this graph because we're going to use it a lot. Um, down here is energy, how much energy we're adding, and it's going to be in joules. Okay? And on the other side is going to be the temperature. The y-axis is the temperature. And I'm going to go ahead and use it in degrees Celsius. And I'm going to just put some marks on here. Just what I'm going to talk about um, per, for ha perhaps water, just because we know what all this, the temperatures are. And I'm going to have a one right here, and that one is going to be zero degrees Celsius. And so this down here is actually going to be a negative. I'm starting off below, so this maybe this is negative five degrees Celsius, okay? And then after zero, I'm going to increase it up to 100 degrees Celsius, and then maybe. 110 degrees Celsius. Now, this is obviously not to scale. So what I want to do is start off way, way down here with some ice, and it's at negative 5 degrees Celsius. It's very cold ice. I'm going to add some energy, and as I add the energy, the temperature of the water is going to rise. See the temperature is going from negative 5 to 0. Notice it's on a slant, and you can see the temperature change. I'm adding energy, this amount of energy, and then once it reaches zero, that is the melting point or the freezing point of water. So at this point, it's going to melt, and so the, I'm going to keep adding energy, and the energy I add now is going to change it from a solid to a liquid. And then, once I turn it all the way into a liquid, I'm going to add more energy, and it's going to slowly rise in temperature. It's going to have another part of it that's energy until it reaches right here, which is approximately 100 degrees Celsius. And at this point, I've turned all, I'm, I'm going to, I've reached the boiling point, the part where it vaporizes, the part where it turns from a, a liquid into a gas. And then I'm going to add more energy to the next section. And that is where it's going, oops, I have this straight mark in my washing, I'll get rid of it here. And that is where it's going to go from um, a liquid into a gas, again a phase change, and then I add a little bit more energy. Now let's talk about each section. So we start off with a negative 5 degrees ice, and I'm going to just kind of pull this down here. The amount of energy in this section is what changes the ice 
from really cold ice to, to right here where we have zero degree ice. Still a solid. Then I add a little bit more energy, and that's going to be this section, where I add more energy, and now it's melting. So that melting has a special term they call fusion. And so this would be where the heat of fusion is, or the delta H sub F. Whoops, I lost my pen. There, where'd he go? Heat of fusion. So that's basically the amount of energy it takes to go from here to here. How much energy does it take to change it from a solid to a liquid? Because in this point, it, the particles are all at zero degrees Celsius, and so any other energy I'm putting in, any more energy I'm adding, is going to pull the molecules apart to break those intermolecular forces. Okay, remember the intermolecular forces. Um, dipole, dipole, hydrogen bonds, um, Oh, dispersion, and then, you know, those are the intermolecular forces. Now, when I get over to here, what has happened is this is the latent lazy heat section right here. This is the sensible heat because I can, I can see it um, going up. And this is the latent lazy heat section. Lazy, flat, right there, flat part on the graph, latent. Okay? Now when I go here, I'm going to see another sensible change. You're going to be sensing it. You're going to you'll be measure the temperature change. So I'm adding more energy, and this is another sensible area, and this and this sensible change. It's all the all the diagonal ones are sensible ones. This is where I heat up. So right at this point, I have a zero degree liquid. Because it all turns from a solid to a liquid. Now up here I have 100 degree liquid. It turned all the liquid from zero degrees up to 100 degrees. Now I'm going to add more heat. It's really hard to draw straight lines on this thing. Um, so I add more heat, and this is that latent, lazy heat again. Any place where it's flat, it's latent, latent heat. Now I have, I'm going from, from liquid to a gas. All the energy now is being used, instead of to heat it up, it's to pull those molecules apart even more. To put, turn, turn them into a gas. This is where you have vaporization happen. Vaporization, turning into a vapor. And so the type of energy you have here is the change, the delta heat of vaporization, VAP. So you use the delta heat of fusion for that spot and delta heat of vaporization for that spot. Now when I get onto this side, I had a 100 degree liquid, now I have a 100 degree gas. Well, there's only one S in gas. I told you I can't spell. And then, now we're going to, any more energy we add, basically heats up the gas. We get hot gas up here, hot, hotter than 100. It's still a gas. So this is the warming curve for water. And we're going to calculate, we're going to end up calculating the amount of total energy it takes to start with 5 degrees, negative 5 degrees Celsius ice to 110 degrees or something like that, Celsius gas, latent heat. Now let's go back to the Prezi and we can see the pictures a little bit better. We have this one and <clears throat> oh I didn't save my picture of Superman. Maybe I do another one. I kind of think of the sensible heat as sensible, super sensible and kind of Superman flying up into the sky. It, you can sense it. Notice that it's a solid all through here. Then it becomes a liquid in this section. That's the latent heat of fusion or the big heat of fusion, the delta heat of fusion. And then the sensible heat again, super sensible. And then turning from a, a liquid into a gas. That's where it vaporizes, the latent heat of vaporization. And then heat up the vapor. So you need to understand all pieces of this particular graph. Also, notice when you melt, you're adding latent heat. It's always phase changes always happen at the latent lazy sides. You add heat, you melt. You add more heat, you vaporize. You take heat away. You condense it, you go from a gas to a liquid, you take more heat away, you go from a, a liquid to a solid. So let's go back and look at the notes again. So here, if I started on this section, and um, let's pick a different color for a second, green. If I started here, instead of adding energy, if I took the energy away, I would go from a gas to a 100 degree gas, and I took more energy away, I'd go from a gas 
to a 100 degree liquid, and if I took more energy away, I'd go from a liquid to a zero degree liquid, then I took more energy away, I'd go from a zero degree liquid to a zero degree solid, and if I cooled it off even farther, I'd go from a zero degree solid back down to a negative five degree solid. Okay, that is the latent heat. Make sure you have this understood and this written into your notes. You can pause the video here if you need to. Okay, the molar um, enthalpy of fusion, delta H sub FUS, see that? Fusion. That's where, remember, fusion is where it's melting. Melt. Or it's going from a, a solid to a liquid or from a liquid back to a solid. The amount of heat that has to be added to overcome the intermolecular forces so a solid can melt. This is the type of latent lazy heat. It's defined as the quantity of heat required to melt one mole of a solid to a liquid with no temperature change. Notice that. The latent area, there is no temperature change. We have zero degrees Celsius on both sides. Okay, like the molar enthalpy of fusion. And then we have the molar enthalpy of vaporization, which is just delta H sub V A P or or B, the amount of heat required to convert a mole of a liquid to the boiling point at the same temperature. Again, no no temperature change. So here we are. That's what they're talking about. We have a liquid and we convert it and it's at the same temperature. No temperature change. Lazy. Lazy sensible. I mean lazy lazy latent heat. Okay. You're going to need a reference chart that's going to have molar enthalpies of fusion and vaporization, and I think I have that over here for you somewhere. There it is. Chapter 13's reference chart. These are the formulas you're going to be needing. Honors are going to have some additional formulas. All this will be given to you for the test and the quiz, which is going to be open note, so hopefully that helps. But over here I want you to notice uh, some things. This is um, some values for the delta H of vaporization, kilojoules, the amount of joules or heat kilojoules in every one mole, and for fusion, the amount of heat kilojoules for every one mole. For the fusion is the melting, and the vaporization is turning into a vapor. And then there's just the formula and the substance we're given. And these are specific heat values that we're going to go over in a few minutes, or later on. Um, so that brings us to specific heat. Not all substance um, substances heat at the same rate. Some things cool up really fast quickly, and some cool really quickly rather or heat up fast and some take a long time. Um, the energy that raises one gram of something, now remember one gram, that's a paper clip. Okay, the size of the mass of a paper clip. The, the energy that can heat up one gram of something by one degree Celsius is the specific heat. Now let's look again at my chart over here. There's some specific heats right here. 1.01, .902. Now this doesn't have the units, but here's some units up here. Joules per gram degree Celsius. Joules per gram degree Celsius. So it's a joule. See over here, these are kilojoules. You gotta be, be careful. This is just joules, and it's over grams degree Celsius. So here's the different ones. Now notice too that the specific heat of ice, water, and steam, liquid water and steam, they're slightly different. And that's because it takes slightly different amounts of energy to heat up ice, versus water versus steam. In fact, you can see here, it takes more energy to heat up water than it does to heat up ice or steam. So that is the specific heat values that we're going to be needing to use. Okay, uh, back to this. All right. Now, substances with high specific heat will need large amounts of, in, of energy to um, heat it up. The, the formula you're going to write in here is Q is equal to M C delta T. Remember delta T? Delta T is the change in the temperature. Just like before, the t any time you have a change in, it's always the, the final temperature minus the initial temperature. All right? Or the beginning temperature minus the ending temperature. It's always the second one minus the first one. So this delta T formula you're going to need to know as well. Q is the thermal energy in a substance, and it's going to be measured in joules or kilojoules. Um, M is the mass measured in grams. C sub SP, so you could put an SP down here, is this the specific heat. You get this off the chart. And the T is in temperature actually in Celsius. We don't have to convert it this time. The rates of cooling are also related to, to specific heat. Substances with high specific heat um, retain heat for longer periods of time. 
and the warming cur curve of a substance reveals its relative specific heat. If the temperature rises quickly with the addition of heat, the specific heat is actually low. This means a small amount of heat results in a large change in temperature. A gentle slope um, on a warming curve means a high specific heat because it, you have to add a lot of uh, energy to make the temperature change. So let's go back and look at the Prezi and see if I have some good uh, pictures for that. All right. So there we are in the middle of heat of vaporization. All right, into molecular forces two. So in this uh, lecture, we're going to talk about the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, vapor pressure, and phase change diagram. All right. Mm -hmm. So here we see a uh, phase change, a change of state for, say, uh, any substance. Okay, let's see. Okay, now I'm not going to make you watch all this video, but you can go back and watch this one in the Prezi so you can see all this and listen to another explanation of all this, okay? So we're going to pass on from here. This is just showing you some del delta heats of fusion, a different chart. Um, here's some fusion and vaporization. I gave you some in the reference chart. Um, here we're talking about the specific heat, Q equals MC delta T. And here's some, I wanted you to notice something. Here, these are the specific heats. Here's water, it's liquid water, 4,186 4, joules per kilogram. The other one on your chart said joules per gram, so that would be a slightly different unit, so a slightly different number. Um, but look, it takes 4,186 joules per kilogram to heat up water, but copper only takes 387. So it's a lot easier to heat up copper. Copper's a metal. Metals heat up fast. You should know that when you put a, a spoon or something in a hot bowl or a hot pot. They heat up quickly. So water, you have to heat it up a longer time to get the temperature to change. Copper, you only have to heat it up a little bit of time for the temperature to change. The smaller this number is, the faster it heats up because it only requires 128 joules. This one requires 4,000 joules. So I hope you catch that, okay? Now these are, these are the same units, I mean the same ideas, but in calories. All right, I'm gonna probably go over this one with you in class, so we're gonna skip this for a second. Um, let's see, we're gonna go now to, well, wait a minute, this one said, to draw what you think the warming curve of something with a high specific heat and a curve of something you think would be for low specific heat. So let's go back to our notes, and we're actually going to do that. If you have something with a high specific heat, that means specific heat. That means it takes a lot of energy to heat up, right? A lot is not one is not one word, right? A lot word. Anyway, <coughs> so a lot of energy for high specific heat. So here we have my warming curve, and this is energy. I'm adding energy, and this would be the degree Celsius, the temperature. So if it takes a lot of energy for the temperature to rise, then it would take it would be a slow temperature rise, and then you finally hit a spot to do latent heat, and then that's another slow temperature rise. So this is a high specific heat, but what about a low specific heat? Well, if you have low specific heat, it takes a small amount of energy to heat up, a small amount to cause the temperature to go up. So there's the degree Celsius, and there's the energy, and I'm gonna add, if it has a low specific heat, that means if I add just a little bit of energy, the temperature is gonna go up quickly. So it should have a very steep curve and then the latent heat, and then a very steep curve, and then the latent heat, and then a very steep curve. So you see that with a low specific heat, the temperature goes up fast. With a high specific heat, that specific heat deals with the amount of energy. A lot of energy is a high specific heat. A little bit of energy is a low specific heat, and it changes the temperature in different rates. All right, let's do this problem. If 942 joules of thermal energy are added to 50 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius, what will the final temperature be? All right, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T. 942 joules is the Q because Q measures energy. The mass is in grams, so I'm going to write 50.0 grams. And then we need to know the specific heat of water, so we're going to go back to our reference chart and see if I can find the specific heat of water. 
uh, liquid water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. So 4.184 joules over grams degree Celsius. That's the C. And then we have delta T. I'm going to go ahead and write in delta T. I had Because I don't know the, the change in the temperature. What do I know? I know that this was the initial temperature right here, and it's asking me for the final temperature. So I need to figure out the change in the temperature first. So I just notice that I can cancel out the grams, and um, I can divide by both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by 50 grams, or 50, because I've gotten rid of the grams already. So 50 is gone. Divide both sides by 4.184 joules and over degrees Celsius. So I'd have to just divide it by this same thing over here. Joules and degrees Celsius. So delta T is what's left. Alright. Now you notice too that I can cancel out the joules. So degrees Celsius is my unit, which is great since I'm after um, delta T. And then I just have to put it in my calculator, and when I do, I end up with 4.51 degrees Celsius. 4.51 degrees Celsius, I think. Man, I didn't, so, um, this is the value from the book, and they didn't use this 4, so that might be slightly different, but I'm not going to stop and check that right now. Um, the significant figures uh, are 3 because th this is a measured value and has 3 sig figs. The 50 grams is also a measured value and has 3 sig figs. The 4.184, uh, which is your specific heat value, the one you look up on a chart, that's a, that's a definition. So now we have the delta T. So delta T equals T final minus T initial. 4.51 degrees Celsius equals the final temperature minus the original temperature of 20. 5.1 degrees Celsius. So I add 25 to both sides. So I can now see that the final temperature is 29.6 degrees Celsius. So it's not too hard of a question. Remember, the C's, the specific heat values, these guys right here, you get them off a the chart. Don't worry about them. You always are going to know that. Okay? Alright, let's do the next one. Um, 13 Dash two, we have a 28 gram sample of silver, and it's heated from 15 degrees Celsius to 85. So this is the initial temperature, and this is the final temperature. How many joules? The joules is the Q, the heat. Okay, because the heat is measured in joules. How many joules were added to the sample? All right, Q equals M C delta T. And now I'm going to answer Q, which is easy. I don't have to do any other moving around. We have a 28 gram sample of silver. Well, what is the C? What is the specific heat of silver? I'm going to look and see if it's on my value here. Uh, I don't have it on this one, so I'm going to have to get it directly from the textbook. So if I get it off from the textbook, which there's a chart in the textbook. Um, it is 0.23. So the C value is 0 0.23 joules per gram degree Celsius. So the, your textbook has these values. Um, one of the places that it has it is on page 329. It's specific heat um, chart 13-2. Okay, now what is the delta T? Well, delta T is T final. Remember that? Delta T is T final minus T initial. So that's 85 minus 15. And so um, you could put that directly in if you wanted to, but it's just 70 degrees. It does have to have that specific, I mean, that uh, significant figure because we're down to the ones place. So we put 70 degrees Celsius. And now we can calculate this out. Grams and grams cancel. Degrees Celsius and degrees Celsius cancel, just joules are left. And when I put this all into my computer, I have, or my calculator, I should have 450 joules. So Q is the 450 joules, which is how much heat was added. That was the question. How many, how many joules were added to the sample? All right. 
That brings us to a complex thermodynamic problem, which we're going to cover in class, I believe. Um, if not, that video will be on a separate video for you. Okay, hope this helps. Please be ready to go when we get to class on the next school day. Bye-bye.